Okay, let's get crazy and learn the definitions of the six types of political boundaries that you need to know. And just to keep things spicy, I'm gonna give you some examples of each. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, let's get to it. Okay, now remember that in political geography, one of the main areas of inquiry has to do with territoriality and the act of drawing boundaries around particular pieces of land, which communicates ownership and defines the borders of state sovereignty. But those borders which separate one country from another come in a variety of flavors. And the first flavor is antecedent boundaries, which are boundaries drawn before a territory was populated. And if if you remember the grammar you learned in language arts, that might help you remember this kind of boundary. Do you remember pronoun antecedent agreement? Okay, probably not. So let me remind you with an example. Heimler flosses his toes for funsies. So Heimler is the noun and his is the pronoun. And in this example, Heimler would be the antecedent of the pronoun. And why? Because it comes before the pronoun. So same idea with antecedent boundaries. They are drawn before a territory was populated. For example, the 49th parallel marks the boundary between the United States and Canada, which was the result of a treaty signed in 1846. But but at that point, there were very few Americans living in this territory. Native Americans, on the other hand, well, you know, that's a story we'll save for your U.S. history class. But regardless, this boundary was drawn first, and then over the course of a century, the territory was populated. Okay, second, we have subsequent boundaries, which are boundaries drawn after a territory has been settled and often reflects the development of a cultural landscape. And here we can go to the other side of the United States to see an example, namely the border between Canada and the U.S. on the East Coast. Now, unlike the Western United States, which have basically bupkis for population, this area was highly populated from the earliest days of British colonization of the Atlantic coast. And so, because a sort of cultural boundary already existed, a formal subsequent boundary was established by treaty in 1842. Or another example would be the boundary between Ireland and Northern Ireland. In the 20th century, the folks in Northern Ireland wanted to remain part of the United Kingdom, while the saucy folks in the South wanted to be independent. And as a result, this subsequent boundary was drawn in 1920 to partition the island. Oh, and by the way, if you want note guides to follow along with this video and all my videos, then check the link in the description. Now, a third type of boundary you need to know is actually a kind of subtype of subsequent boundaries, and it's known as a consequent boundary. Now this kind of boundary is drawn with the consideration of different cultural landscapes and they often divide people of different ethnicities, language, and religion. For example, do you remember the last video when we talked about that giant honking geopolitical mess that occurred when victorious powers of World War I created the country of Yugoslavia? Well, it was a mess because they drew those boundaries around many different rival ethnic groups, all of whom longed for a state of their own. And that caused some, uh, problems, but the point here is that after the fall of the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia was broken up and consequent boundaries were drawn with respect to the different cultures within that territory. And that boundary we just talked about between Ireland and Northern Ireland would also be considered a consequent boundary because it was drawn between two distinct cultural landscapes. In that case, religion played a big role with Catholic Christians here and Protestant Christians here. Okay, now the fourth kind of boundary you need to know is a superimposed boundary, which is drawn by an outside conquering force without respect to differences in the cultural landscape. And pay attention here because you need to remember that superimposed boundaries are almost always associated with imperialism and colonialism. For example, recall that during the second wave of European imperialism and the scramble for Africa, imperial powers met at the Berlin conference and carved up Africa for their own dang benefit. And the result was the drawing of superimposed boundaries all across the continent, which in some cases divided culturally cohesive people groups and in other cases jammed rival ethnic groups together. And they were basically the Duke of Wesselton arriving in Arendelle with one goal. Open those gates so I may unlock your secrets and exploit your riches. And yeah, Duke, you said it out loud. Anyway, although there are many examples of this on the African continent, I'm just going to give you one. So Ghana and Togo were carved up by the British and the French and a boundary was drawn dividing a singular cultural unit namely the you people. And then after each country gained its independence, that led to a conflict between the two countries on account of Togo claiming part of Ghana's territory in which the you live. So to put it mildly, these superimposed colonial boundaries have caused an awful lot of conflict since decolonization. And then fifth, you need to know geometric boundaries, which are mathematical boundaries that usually follow lines of latitude or longitude and are drawn without consideration for the natural or cultural features of the territory. For example, the Western US-Canada border that we talked about earlier follows the 49th parallel. Or consider again the superimposed colonial boundaries in Africa like you see between Kenya and Tanzania, or Somalia and Ethiopia. And then finally, we have relic boundaries, which are boundaries that once existed but no longer function as boundaries. But even though they no longer exist, the effect of that border still remains. And the classic example here is the Berlin Wall, which divided Germany after World War II. Now, Western powers controlled West Germany, and the Soviet Union controlled East Germany. And because of the financial support from Western powers, West Germany's economy flourished while East Germany's economy struggled under Soviet dominance. Now, that wall came down in 1989, and Germany was reunited, but the effects of that division can still be seen today. In the western part of modern Germany, the housing is varied and vibrant, while eastern housing is dull and drab on account of the differences in economic development imposed by decades of separation. Well, okay, click here to keep reviewing for Unit 4 and click here to grab my video note guides, which are going to help you follow along with all my videos and get all the contents of this course firmly crammed into your brain folds. And I'll catch you on the flip-flop. Heimler out.